Hello everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about different ways to measure the location of data within a data set. So when we are discussing the location of data within a data set, we're really talking about where it lies within the data when the data is all lined up in order from least to greatest. Saying a certain value is like the ninth or 10th data point is useful on its own. It does let us know how many uh, data values are below that ninth or 10th point, like eight or nine respectively, but it doesn't let us know how many values are above that point unless we also know the size of the sample or the data set that we're working with. And furthermore, if we do know the size of the data set, if we're comparing similar uh, quantities together, they're coming from different data sets. Maybe one data set has a size of 100 and another data set has a size of 2,500. Then kind of knowing uh, how many values are above or below those given values um, you know, can be interpreted differently. So to alleviate some of these issues and kind of get everything to the same scale, when we're talking about the location of data within a data set, we're going to be using percentiles and quartiles. So we create the percentiles by dividing the data into hundredths, and we create the quartiles by dividing the data into fourths, although we'll pretty often express those quartiles in terms of percentiles, like the first quartile is gonna be the same as the 25th percentile, the second quartile, or two quarters, is the same as the 50th uh, percentile, and so on. And so when we're finding these data values that correspond to certain percentiles or certain quartiles, we'll sometimes have to be very careful because our data may not always be a multiple of 100 or a multiple of four. So it might not be divided into those pieces uh, very easily. We'll have to be careful in how we approach those situations. So next I wanna uh, give a little bit more information about these quartiles. Let's go ahead and define the first, second, and third quartile. We're going to denote the first quartile with Q with a subscript of one. So when you see Q sub one, that is our first quartile. And remember, the first quartile is equivalent to the 25th percentile. And so this is going to be a value of data from our data set. And what this value represents is it lets us know that 25% or one quarter of the other data in the set is going to be less than or equal to that value. So next we're going to define the second quartile. That's going to be denoted by Q with a subscript of two. So Q2 is our second quartile. And that's like being equivalent to the 50th percentile. And one other important thing to note about this second quartile is that you might not actually see Q2 showing up in some of the, uh, the software that we'll be using to do these calculations for us, because another way to interpret the second quartile is that it is our median, right? Remember our earlier definition of the median is, it's the value that 50% of the data is below and 50% of the data is above, but that's the same thing as the 50th percentile or the second quartile. So we'll often see Q2 being uh, represented with M instead, representing the median. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the next quartile, which is gonna be the third quartile. The third quartile is like the 75th percentile. And so we know that 75% of the data values are going to be less than or equal to this Q3 value, and equivalently, 25% of the data is going to be greater than this Q3 value. And well, we could actually define a fourth quartile. The fourth quartile would be like the 100th percentile, meaning 100% of the data is less than or equal to that fourth quartile value, but that's just really the maximum data value in our data set. And similarly, we could define a zero fourth tile where 0% of the data is uh, below that data value for Q0, but that's just the minimum value in our data set. So we'll talk more about percentiles and quartiles when we do some examples in just a few minutes. But another really important thing we're looking at when we're looking at a set of data is not just the location of the data, but how the data is spread out amongst the data set. And so it's often used to help quantify the spread of data about our center or the median is looking at how far are the first and third quartiles apart from each other. This difference between the third quartile and the first quartile gives us a nice spread. It tells us that like 50% of our values are gonna be in that range between the first and third quartile. 
And so the numerical value of that spread or that range of numbers between Q1 and Q3 is what we call the interquartile range or IQR for short. So again, IQR stands for the interquartile range. It's just a single number. It's the number that we get when we calculate the difference between Q3 and Q1, our third and first quartile. And the interpretation of this single number, the IQR, is it's giving us the distance between the middle 50% of the data or like the spread uh, between that middle 50% of data. So now that we've defined these really important concepts, let's go ahead and look at an example where we find these quartiles and this interquartile range. All right, so in this example, we're gonna find the first quartile, the median or second quartile, the third quartile, as well as the interquartile range for this set of data, where our set of data is a student's uh, 10 quiz scores for a certain class. And so here we have our 10 quiz scores are already in our nice order from least to greatest. And one thing that's often helpful is besides just ordering your data from least to greatest, actually kind of writing the index value next to each one of those data points. So this is our first data point. So I might call that I equals one for index one, it's the first in our ranking. 68 would be I equals two the second lowest data point in our ranking. And then I'll go ahead and fill out the rest real quick. All right, so here we have our data all nice and organized in order from least to greatest, as well as indexed in the appropriate order. Um, our data might not always be represented in this format. Uh, it may be represented in something like a frequency table instead, but the process is gonna be very, very similar. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started now. So let's go ahead and start calculating these quantities, but we're not gonna start with Q1. Let's actually start with M or the median or Q2, because that's a quantity that we know how to find. We've talked about that before. And so remember the kind of conceptual definition of the median is that half of our data points have to be low this value and the other half of our data points have to be above this value. When we have a small size data set like we do here, it's pretty easy to eyeball where the median should be. If we have 10, then half of our data is gonna be kind of below the, uh, the fifth or sixth value and the other half is gonna be above the fifth or sixth value. So our median should be kind of right in the middle between that fifth and sixth value or the average between 86 and 89. But remember, we also have a more numerical way to calculate this, which is really handy when our data set is large and we can't just kind of visually and quickly identify where the median is. So remember, in the more kind of numerical approach, we start by not finding the median, but finding the index value corresponding to the median. And so our median index value, or I, is always given by the formula n plus one over two, where n represents the total number of values in our data set. And so we have 10 data values in our data set. So our median index is gonna be given by 10 plus one over two, or 11 over two, but that's gonna be 5.5. And that's telling us that it should be between the fifth and sixth value. And remember, we have to also interpret that as taking the average between the fifth and sixth data value. So now we know the median or Q2 is gonna be equal to the average between 86 and 89. So to find that average, we add them together and divide by two, and that ends up being 87.5. And so remember, the median as well as these quartiles don't actually necessarily have to be within our data set, but they are numbers or values that are dividing our data set into these separate pieces. For the median, we know that half of our data values are gonna be below this number and the other half are going to be above this number. And so we can draw that line right here if we want. And we see that we have five numbers above our median as well as five numbers below our median. And so now if we wanna calculate our other two quartiles, like the first quartile or the third quartile, we can do that really just by finding the median of these two halves of our data that we just created. What I mean by that is that Q1 is gonna be equal to the, uh, the median of the, the kind of lower half of our data. While Q3 or our third quartile or that 75th percentile is gonna be the median of the upper half of our data set. And so because these two halves of our data set have an odd number of values, we will be actually able to find that nice median value and it will be a value within our data set. So it's kind of the middle number of our lower half of data. Well, we can see pretty clearly that that is gonna be 74. So our first quartile or Q1 has a data value of 74 and our uh, median for the upper half of data uh, or the third quartile is gonna be, let's see, what's the, middle number here, it's 95. So 95 is our third quartile. 
74 is our first quartile, and our median is that average between 86 and 89, or 87.5. And so we found our median as well as our first and third quartiles. With that information, really just the first and third quartiles, we're now ready to find IQR, or the interquartile range. Remember, the interquartile range is given by the difference between Q3 minus Q1. And so let's see where our values. That's going to be the difference between 95 and 74. And the difference between 95 and 74 is 21. So we now know that the IQR or the interquartile range is 21. That's kind of the range or the distance between that value at our uh, first quartile and the value at our third quartile. 50% of our data falls within this range of 21 numbers. And so there's one more important note that I want to make that wasn't really relevant to this example. Um, so in our example, we had 10 quiz scores, but if we had a, a data set with an odd number of values, so like say we had 11 instead of 10 quiz scores, then we got to not include the median or that M value when we're finding Q1 and Q3. Right, so if we actually have a median value in our data set, then we don't consider that as being part of that lower half or top half of data when we're finding the medians for that lower and top half of data or when we're finding the first and third quartiles. So just remove that uh, median if you do have a odd number of data values and then go throughout the same process to finding Q1 and Q3 that we used here. Okay, one other important note I want to make about the IQR or that inner quartile range that is also a really great application of it is that it helps us identify potential outliers within our data set. So we say that a value is a potential outlier if it is smaller than the number given by Q1 minus 1.5 multiplied by the IQR or if it is larger than Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR. So remember that IQR helps us kind of identify that band of data that, you know, kind of captures that middle 50%, but an outlier is like an extreme value far outside of the center of our data set. So remember that IQR helps us kind of identify that band of data that, you know, kind of captures that middle 50%, but an outlier is like an extreme value far outside of the center of our data set. And so if we kind of take these lower bounds of the first and third quartile and subtract uh, or add away this multiple of this range, the IQR, it lets us take a little bit of a step outside of that central 50% of our data. And if we're like too large of a step outside of our center of data, then we may be working with a potential outlier. And so a key word here is calling these things potential outliers because we really need to know more context for the situation to actually identify it as an outlier. Like maybe that data value that is very far away from our center is included in the data set because it's just like a, uh, a misrecording or a malfunction in some instrument. But maybe it's like a really important data value, like a high priced home or a low salaried employee, in which case it may still be appropriate to include them in the data set. So this process helps us identify potential outliers, but it alone is not saying they are outliers and we need to get rid of them. We always have to take the context of the situation into account and just do a little bit more analysis. So let's go ahead and finish this example off by trying to identify any potential outliers in these quiz scores. So if we want to calculate these potential outliers, we have to find these two numbers, Q1 minus 1.5 times IQR and Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR. They're going to give us a lower and upper bound or a range of numbers. If one of our data values is not within that range, like it's lower than or bigger than these values, then we know it's a potential outlier. So this lower bound for a potential outlier is going to be Q1 minus 1.5 times the interquartile range. So our Q1 value was 74. And we have to subtract away from that 1.5 multiplied by our spread of the middle 50% of data, or the IQR, and we found that to be 21. So we multiply 21 by 1.5 and subtract that number from 74. And when we do this, we should get a value of 42.5. And so this is what we expect would be a reasonable like lower bound of normal data for this data set. So if we have any quiz scores less than 42.5, we might identify them as potential outliers. And so here we can kind of scan our list pretty quickly and we do see we have one quiz score of 20 that is lower than 42.5. So that is a potential outlier.
And that probably doesn't come as too big of a surprise. If we look at this set of data and just use our own intuition, our intuition probably says, well, that score of 20 looks a little unusual or off. It's not nearly as close to the other data values. And that's true. We do have this really valuable intuition. But what this process is doing is helping us quantify our intuition. And it'll help us in situations where our intuition is wrong. And so remember, the upper bound for potential outliers is Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR. Our third quartile value was 95. So we're going to take 95 and add to that 1.5 times 21. And if we do that successfully, we should get a value of 116.5. So any quiz scores that are bigger than 116.5 could also be identified as potential outliers. Oh, we don't have any in our list and it's actually impossible. It's well, most likely impossible to get higher than 100% on your quiz. And so there really is no potential for these kind of upper outliers, but we did have one potential lower outlier in this data set.